Welcome everyone back to Fun with WebGL 2.0. We are now officially on lesson four. Starting off with what we had in the previous lesson, I actually took out a lot of the stuff that we don't need. As you can see, the global variables have been slimmed down just to four and took away a lot of the comments because by now they should make sense to you. And as you see, our load event has been slimmed down significantly. We have a lot less code to deal with and it makes more sense of what's going on, uh, which is kind of bare bones at this point. But our framework has allowed us to really um, keep things nice and slim and easy to manage. Uh, one thing you'll notice is that our test shader now has an array in its constructor. In this array, we're actually setting up four colors. Uh, we have gray, red, green, and blue. Uh, this gives us a chance to play with uniforms in a different way. This time we're going to pass in an array of vectors instead of just a single uniform vector. After that, you'll see that we have our mesh set up almost the same way as we had it last time. Last time, we had five points. Now, this time, I slimmed it down to four points. But as you can see, the draw mode is no longer GL points. It's GL lines, because now we're going to draw lines this time around. But we've graduated from points. Now we're going to do some line drawing. In that array, all we're doing is setting up two different lines. And in each line requires two positions. So we're making one vertical line and one horizontal line. And now in our, our render function, you see that's been slimmed down quite a bit. It's basically down to its bare bones. In this instance, we got rid of the set function from the previous lesson because we don't really need it anymore. Since we're not changing the colors at per frame, uh, we could just get rid of that and put it into the constructor. Now you can see what our test shader looks like, and it's also more minimalistic than last time. Uh, in this case, we're not saving the uniform location because we only need to set it once and we're doing it during the constructor. And as you can see, we pass in the array and we use uniform 3FV, which is three floats vector. This is no difference from sending an, a single vector of three floats. Just make sure your array has a complete set of three float vectors. For example, if you send in two colors, make sure you have six floats in your array. Now we're moving on to our shaders. Now we're going to see some of the changes we made in the shader code to handle this week's lesson. This time around, we're going to do some fun, fancy stuff with our shaders. Uh, one thing we're going to do is we're going to have two attributes tied to a single position uh, float array. So that means we're going to actually combine our position and our color index into a single array and buffer. And then we're going to partition the data out into two separate attributes. So a position is what we're used to, is our position. And now we're going to add a float, a color, which is going to be a single float that we're going to add into our a position. And this time around, you see something a little bit different. You see layout location equals four. In the previous lesson, we showed you how to uh, predefine the location of an attribute uh, in code before you link an application. But in WebGL 2.0, we have the fun ability to actually predefine location numbers in the shader code itself. So today, we're just going to play around with that a little bit. And I picked position 4 because I think we have position 0, 1, 2 kind of predefined already. So I picked 4 as a, as a good starting number just to, ha just to get out of the way. Um, and as you can see, the next thing we have is our U-color uniform, which is an array of four uh, vector three floats. And, you know, we're going to pass in four sets of colors, and that's what that ar array is at the very beginning of our test shader constructor. And our vertex shader is actually going to pass a color back to the fragment shader. So with this one, I start playing with precision since low precision works pretty well with color. There's no need to use low precision but for, for this context, but we'll say, why not? Let's play around with it. Let's make it as efficient as possible. Then in our main function, we're going to actually create the color. Uh, we're doing this using our uniform array, and then we're also going to use our attribute color that we're going to partition later. And we're going to use that as our index to grab the specific color that we passed in with, through our uniform. Um, since a color is a float, we need to convert it into an int to, to use it as an indexer for our array. And that's really all the gist of what's going on in this uh, shader. The one interesting thing here is that we're not doing our attribute color yet. 
so by default it's going to return zero. So no matter what, we're always going to grab the first color of our uniform until we start actually partitioning our data down the line. And last and but not least, our fragment shader is bare bones as you can get it. It just grabs a color from a vertex shader and saves it right back out as our final color. Now if you go back to the browser and refresh, you'll see what we have. We have our vertical and horizontal line. And we can celebrate because there will be no more drawing points for us. It's nothing but lines and triangles from here on in. Now let's talk about how we're going to set up our data. Um, in previous lessons, we kind of set everything up as its own separate attributes. Uh, but now we're actually going to try to combine our data sets into one single attribute and then partition it. And here on the screen, I have an example of how it's going to be how it's going to work in theory by using string manipulations. So if you look at it at the our line one, we have vertex array, and basically we have x y z c x y z c. So in that we have uh, two vertex chunks of data, which would be our x y z, which are b position, and then c would be our color number, be our color float. And now we're going to be something called stride, and stride is how big our chunk of data is. Uh, normally we would just say three because it's three floats, but stride at this point is going to be four because now we have four uh, four floats per vertex. And then GL is going to just loop through our array and grabbing each chunk at a time by four. So it's kind of like what number six is doing. You know, the first loop it's going to start at position zero and then it grabs the first four characters in the array. And then we have line 9 and 10. So we have our chunk. Now we're going to actually partition the data. As you can see in line 9, we are going to um, start at position 0 and grab the first three. So it will actually grab x, y, z. And then for our tribute color, it's going to start at position 3 and get the length of 1 because we only want one float because we're, we're going to use that as the index of our color array. So for every position we're going to have an index of the color array that we're passing into our shader. And that's pretty much how we're going to set up the data and how it's going to work in theory. Now we're going to create a new file called primitives.js. We're going to keep a lot of our primitives here. Uh, so for now, we're going to create a primitive called grid access. And this is where we're going to create our grid uh, for today's lesson. And as you can see, it's going to be a static class and it's going to have its own static uh, function called create mesh. So this way we can create our mesh VAO object uh, right here. Um, I know in previous lesson we set up a standard and now we're going to actually break the standard and build something new. Um, the reason why is because we're actually playing with our data. So instead of keeping everything separated in its own buffers, we're actually going to merge everything together. So when you want to do something custom, you kind of have to do this. You know, you kind of have to kind of redo the mesh function over again to handle the specific data you're trying to build. So as if you look at line four, we have vertex. And in there, you'll see there is four pieces per for vertex. So the first three uh, numbers are our position, and the fourth one will be our color. And on line six, you'll see attribute color location, because remember, we hard-coded uh, position four inside our shader. So now we're just putting it here so we can start using it in our code. And the rest is pretty much self-explanatory, because we've done this already. You know, we, we've, we're creating the mesh object, or struct, I should say, and, you know, we're adding the draw mode, which is lines, and well, we're creating our um, VAO right now. And then we set up our vertex component len. And like we said before, our our vertex component length is four because you know, we have three floats for position and one float for color. Uh, you know the following lines are pretty much self-explanatory, and then we have our stride line, length length. Uh, this is a little different because stride length is how many bytes is our vertex data. So we know for sure that our the amount of components we're going to have is about four floats. But that's not how, how big it really is. So for every float takes four bytes. So we're using float32 array to actually get how many bytes each float has. And then we're multiplying it by how many components. So it's four bytes per float times four floats. 
that gives us our stride length. And that's something we're gonna need when we start partitioning our data. Uh, after that, we set up our buffers. We've done this before a couple of times, so there's nothing new here. Um, and then we go to line 23, and this is where we're gonna start partitioning our data a little bit. And I put a comment for each attribute, or I should, um, each parameter in the function vertex attrib pointer kind of explains what each one does. And it, it, we've, we've seen this before. So we add in our location, we tell it that the data is three floats long. We tell it the type is a float. Uh, I never really explained the next position, uh, the next parameter, which we've always put as false, but that is just asking you if we want to normalize the data. And we never do. It's only in special cases you might want to actually normalize the data. After that, it's our stride length. It's, you know, again, how long is our vertex data in bytes? And then the final parameter is the offset. It's basically kind of where's the starting position we're going to start reading from. So ideally, we're going to start from three and then re, um, start at zero and then read three floats worth. <coughs> and then after that, we're doing the next um vertex of trip pointer and this is for our color location but as you can see normally we would actually bind a new buffer then do a pointer this time we're not we're going to we're do binding one buffer and we're setting up two attributes on this single buffer and just like the previous one uh, we had location but this time it's a single float we remember it, it's we just have that additional float and the same stride length and the only difference is the final parameter is the offset. How far do we start? And again, uh, we have to use this by uh, how many bytes. So um, the starting position is three. So it's th three floats in we need to start at. And it's th four bytes per float. So it's four times three is the starting position and our stride uh, length is the length which is four bytes times four. And then we just finalize everything. You know, we get we unbind our stuff, we save our mesh into our GL context in case we need to unload it later and return the mesh. And that's really that's all to it for our primitive grid. So now if we go back to our HTML page, now the only thing we're gonna do is add our primitives.js file to it. And then line 30, you see I commented out our original mesh code, and now we're just gonna create a new model that calls our grid access create mesh and that's it now all our mesh data is now saved into our G model so back in the browser we get to see what we just did we actually create a single line that actually interpolates between two different colors because if you go look at the array the fourth element of each uh, vector or each uh, vertex it, we set up different indexes so the first point goes to index 1 and the second point goes to index two. So it now interpolates between the two colors, which is gray and red. But as you can see, this is not the grid I promised you. So let's go back to our primitives.js file and actually write the real grid uh, functionality. Here we're gonna replace our vert array with all this new pile of code that's on the screen. Um, we're gonna set up a couple of things. We're gonna set up an empty verts array and we're going to set up some settings. So how big do we want the grid to be? And from the center point of our canvas, you can only go one unit uh, in, each, in either direction. So the entire canvas is about two units big in all directions. So I put 1.8, so it's very close to the edge. Uh, and then div is just how many times do we want to divide the grid up uh, in, in horizontal and vertical planes. And then step uh, sets up how much we how much each line is spaced between the the one point eight size. It's just you know st you know when we create the lines, how many times do we step? You know what what's the distance between each line in the grid? And then the half creates the starting point of uh, where we start drawing the grid. Uh, since the origin exists in the middle of the canvas and we have our total size, we divide by half and actually set up as negative because it will start in the negative x position and it will actually be positive for y because it will actually start in a positive y. Uh, you'll see that in the array because uh, you'll see when we're creating our vertical lines p equals negative half plus 
i times step. And that just steps us through through all the lines we want to make vertically. And our horizontal lines, uh, it's, it's practically the same thing, except we start at the positive y position. And that's it. It's that This would actually generate our grid very simply, and it creates uh, four floats per vertex, which, like I said, will contain our x, y, z, and our c component, which is our color index. So now if you go back to the browser, you will see our grid. And you'll see that it actually fades from red to gray because we're kind of alternating back and forth between the index of 0 and 1 of our colors. And we're not going to stop here because I had a comment about uh, line graphs in WebGL 2.0. So we're just going to add a little bit extra. So if we go back to our code, uh, we're going to add two new lines. And they're positioned to draw an extra lines from point to point on, of each corner. I'm not actually creating a line graph here, but I'm illustrating that you can just keep adding more lines to our array. So if you're going to make a line graph, you, you create uh, point A and B. And then for the next bit of data, you repeat B and you go to C, repeat C, go to D, go to repeat D, and you know go to E, and so on and so forth to actually create your line graph. So let's go back to the browser and see what I did. And this is the result. You know, we have our grid, and now I'm drawing two additional lines that go from point to point on each corner. So, you know, ideally, you, if you do a little bit of math, you can connect the dots on any point in the grid or in the middle grid. Just got to measure everything based on our half and whole values that we're using. You know, uh, you're going to have to deal with normals. So you're going to normalize a lot of your data to actually get it just right on the grid. So... Um, that's pretty much it for the lesson today. Uh, you know, the grid is not that special, but in two lessons, it's going to be the floor of our 3D world, um, just like how it is in 3D modeling tools. Uh, so in two lessons, we're going to do transforms and cameras, and this will become uh, something as our starting bed to actually start actually playing with actual models and things in the future. So we're almost at a good point where we're really going to start having some fun. So that's it for now. Um, so, you know, uh, if you have any comments, please leave them. Um, I'll answer them. And maybe you have some ideas that I can actually incorporate into future lessons, uh, just like uh, that line graph guy uh, did. So, yes, just so like, subscribe, and feel free to contact me about any questions you have and suggestions. Uh, have a great time, and I'll see you guys in the next lesson.